In today's episode, we're continuing to talk about sexuality and how we can navigate it in a way that honors God and ultimately leaves us with fewer regrets. everyone, welcome to Epic Everywhere, practical teaching to help you grow in your faith no matter where you are on your spiritual journey. My name is Emily and I'm the pastor of Epic Online and I'm really glad that you're here today. We've got a great day ahead, including a really challenging but encouraging message. But first, we're gonna go ahead and take time to pray together and then we've got a song from our band, Epic MSC. The lyrics of this song describe the power of God. His authority is above all, and that's why we can trust Him and say yes to Him in absolutely everything. You may have something in your life where you wanna see God's power, to see Him at work in your situation. So we're gonna go ahead and take time to pray together. And I wanna read you a scripture verse that tells us how we should pray. Hebrews 4.16 tells us this, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So would you go ahead and pray with me and believe that God hears your prayer, that he wants you to call out to him and that he will meet you with his mercy and his grace in your time of need. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come before you, Lord, and to uh, express anything that might be weighing heavy on our hearts and our minds. Lord, we come boldly before you, asking and believing that you're gonna show up in a mighty way in, in a situation that we're facing or a circumstance that maybe has been around for far too long. Lord, today we take time to trust you and to follow you boldly wherever you may lead, knowing that your authority reigns above all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Creation knows the voice that spoke into the void. The breath that brought the dust to life and sang the stars to form. The dark feels your voice that drove it back before and though the night is long I know your light will drive it back once more one
and strongholds not be moved will spirits not be silent and cower at his rule for if my god is for me then what have i to fear for nothing Thanks so much for praying with us and worshiping with us. You know, we'd love to continue to pray with you with whatever you might be walking through. I'm gonna tell you how you can share your prayer request with us in just a moment. But first, I wanna personally welcome anyone who is new with us today. Hey, we believe that church should be fun and meaningful and that it should make a difference in your life. And that's exactly what we hope you experience with us today. And as your pastor, I wanna make sure that you get connected around here, that you don't just kinda of check a box each time you're hanging out with us, but that you take time to be seen and to be known. One thing that you can do to get and stay connected with us is to text in. So we're gonna go ahead and do that together right now. You can scan the QR code on the screen or text here to 215-999-8575. And when you're new and you text in for the first time, we've got a free t-shirt that we wanna go ahead and mail to you just to say thanks for hanging out with us today. When you text in, not only does it let us know that you were here with us today, it also gives you access to the hub. One thing that you can do on the hub is share a prayer request with us. Like I mentioned before, we want to be able to join you in prayer in whatever you might be going through. You're not alone. Let us know how we can pray for you today. You can also give through the hub. You know, giving regularly is how we keep Jesus first in our lives. And it's also how we support the ministry that happens in and through our church. So thank you to everyone who continues to give to fuel the life change that we get to witness right here at Epic. Well, today we're continuing our Tough Talk series. As we go through this series, we're exploring what God's word has to say on some topics that are more difficult to talk about, but they're still really important. And I wanna give everyone a heads up today, especially parents. If you happen to have little children, little ears around you, the content today and then next week is designed for adults. So just a heads up as we continue. But right now, let's go ahead and get to today's message. Hey everybody, my name is Kent. I'm lead pastor here at Epic, and I'm so glad that you're doing church with us today. We're in the middle of a series called Tough Talks, 
And that's because the topics that we're hitting as we walk throughout this series can be difficult to discuss. But these are conversations that are worth having. And that's because God cares about every area of our lives. Even the ones that are hard to talk about or even learn about. Those that are maybe a little more challenging for us to understand. Now, as we walk through this series, here's how we kicked it off. Week one, we started with a softball. Politics, right? Not a softball at all. Anyways, we learned that things are not always so black and white or red and or blue for that matter. We learned that we are citizens of a greater kingdom and that Jesus is the king of that kingdom. And so that should be the thing for us as we engage with politics that comes first. Now, that could have been an entire series all on its own. So I'm really looking forward to talking more about this in our Tough Talks Q&A later on this month. And so make sure that you send in your questions. You can do that through the hub. And if we don't get to answer your question at the, at the Q&A at the end of this month, we will reach out and directly answer your question if you submit it. Now, last week we talked about sex and sexuality. We learned that while our culture can have a casual perspective on sex, the scriptures actually seem to have a much more elevated view on sex with some clear directives for this part of our lives. Now today, we're going to take some time to answer some of the questions that were posed in last week's talk. Um, and so if you missed that talk for any reason, make sure you go back and give it a listen. And before we get to that, I, I want to kick things off by sharing um, a time from Scripture where Jesus actually gave what, for many of those who were listening, uh, was considered a tough talk. And in fact, um, in this passage of Scripture, we're going to see how someone actually calls it a hard teaching. And I want to share that with you because I think that it gives us some insight as to how we as followers of Jesus can respond whenever we find ourselves in a similar situation. So here we go. John chapter six. Let me set it up. Here, here's what's going on here. So Jesus had just done this massive miracle where he feeds 5,000 people with just five loaves and two fish, like basically a lunch. That's all it took. And he was able to feed all those people. Now everyone is amazed by this. And they're thinking, you know what? This Jesus guy is the real deal. Like we should make him king. Like they already start working on like campaign signs and slogans and all that kind of stuff. The disciples loved that idea because they're thinking, hey, if Jesus becomes king, then we'll be set for life. And Jesus, however, had no interest in any of that. And so Jesus actually uh, escapes the crowds. And then the next day we find that he, found, he, he, he lands in this small town called Capernaum. And he's teaching in their synagogue when all of a sudden hundreds of the people who saw the miracle the day before show up while Jesus is teaching. They, they tracked him down. Like they, went, they were looking for him. And the reason why they did is because they wanted to see Jesus do that, you know, bread and fish thing again. And so Jesus sees this as a teachable moment. And he, he says, hey, hey, listen, everybody, like I gave you bread yesterday, but now see that you're hungry again. Listen, God wants to give you something better than that. God wants to give you spiritual bread for your soul and that this bread, it'll fill you up for eternity. And he's, he's trying to make this leap from our physical hunger that can never be satisfied to our spiritual hunger that can be satisfied fully and finally through him. And here's how he says it. He says, I am the bread of life that comes from heaven. Anyone who comes to me will never be hungry and never be thirsty again. And I want to pick up the story with some of the people's response to him saying that. John chapter 6, starting in verse 41, it says this, At this, the Jews there began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that comes down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? And so some of them that were gathered there, they're like, wait, wait a minute. You're not from heaven. You're like from Sixth and Lombard. Like we know you and we know your parents. What are you talking about? And there's, there's a little more back and forth. And then Jesus keeps talking about being the bread of life. And then he takes this illustration seemingly a little too far. Verse 54, he says this, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise them up at the last day. It is like, really, Jesus? I mean, at this point, even the people that believe that he really was from heaven are like, okay, Jesus, like, like we were with you all the way up to the whole cannibalism part. You know, you had to throw that in there, and then you're gonna raise them up on the last day, and so now we got like a whole zombie situation. 
And everybody listening, standing there like hoping for like a psych or a, a just kidding or a, a gotcha moment. But no, Jesus doubles down. He goes on, he says this, he says, for my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Now, can you imagine how this must have sounded to everybody who was gathered there listening to him teach? And the crowd just kind of starts to whisper to one another. They're like, you know, I don't think he's going to do that whole fish thing. And people in the back start kind of packing up their stuff and just kind of slipping away. People in the front are like, oh, why do we have to sit all the way up here? Like I told you, we need to sit by the door at these things so we can just kind of get out if we need to. Now, at some point, all of this is going to make more sense because Jesus is going to introduce communion. And he'll sit down and he'll break some bread and he'll pour some wine. And he'll explain that the bread represents his body that's going to be broken for them. And how the wine represents his blood that's going to be shed for them. But everyone in this moment is like, ah, oh, like thoroughly confused. Now, I want you to look how they respond. Verse 60. On hearing it, many of his disciples... And this is not like the 12 closest followers that he had. It's not talking about them. He'll talk about them in just a moment. But many of his disciples or many of the people who saw him do miracles and decided to follow him around, many of his disciples said, this, here it is, is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? In other words, man, this is a tough talk. Like who can embrace it? Like who can go along with this? I mean, who even wants to be associated with this? And here, this is the moment that Jesus starts to lose the crowd. And the 12 apostles are, are watching this go down and they're thinking to themselves, no, 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 no. Jesus, don't, don't lose the crowd. Like, don't mess this up. Like, we're just starting to get some momentum. Like, you're on the verge of being the king, which means we're on the verge of kind of being there too. And they were also thinking, you know what, Jesus? Don't lose the crowd because if you lose the crowd, then the Pharisees are going to try to kill you. And if they try to kill you, they might miss you and hit us. And so they're freaked out at this point. Verse 61, aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? In other words, he's like, is this, is this, this teaching, is it tripping you up? And he continues. Um, and over the next few verses, he talks a little bit more. And then John makes sure to record what a pivotal moment this was for people. Verse 66, from this time, many of his disciples or many of the people in the crowd that had been following him around and learning from him, many of them, look, turned back and no longer followed him. Many of them were like, you know what? Hey, love the miracles, love the healings, loved it when you might've been king, but now not so much. I think I'm done. And they no longer followed Jesus. The 12 apostles are, are sitting there. They're listening to Jesus and they're watching the crowd listening to Jesus, watching the crowd, listening to Jesus, watching the crowd. And one by one, they see more and more people just kind of start to check out. More and more people start to, to leave and make their way away. And they begin thinking to themselves, you know what? Maybe, maybe I should go too. Like when nobody's looking, maybe I'll just kind of slide back behind this column and then just disappear into the crowd. And then Jesus who knows the hearts of men, pauses in the middle of his sermon, in the middle of his talk, he turns to the 12 and he says this in verse 67, you don't want to leave too, do you? Oh, snap. Jesus read their mail. Like he knew. You know, at this moment, that's exactly what they wanted to do because suddenly following Jesus got hard. Suddenly following Jesus wasn't going to lead to like a cushy job in the palace with all the perks. Now, following Jesus meant associating with a message that wasn't very popular, with a message that wasn't being very well received by others. And so what are they going to do? Like here in this moment of decision, Jesus calls them out. You don't want to leave too, do you? What are they going to do? And we'll circle back at the end of this message and I'll show you how this plays out. But I wanted to bring this up because I think it's so relevant to us as we go through a series like this. You see, you need to know that if you're a follower of Jesus, then there's going to be times when it's hard to follow. There's going to be times when it, it doesn't feel like it's to your advantage anymore to follow. There's going to be times when you look at what it means to follow Jesus's teachings and you struggle in how you're going to respond because you don't want to follow Jesus's teachings. When that happens, what are you going to do? How are you going to respond? 
See, part of the reason why it's so important that we talk about some of these challenging topics from time to time is because we want you to be able to meet that moment and then navigate it in a way that honors God so that ultimately you won't have any regrets. Now, the other thing I wanted to touch on today before we, we land the plane on, on this part of the talk is I wanted to talk a little bit about the tension between grace and truth. So whenever you open up the gospels and you, you look at how Jesus lived, you look at how he loved, you looked at how he led, you see that there's a tension there. In John chapter one, verse 14, it says that Jesus came from the father and that he was full of grace and truth, grace and truth. See, somehow Jesus was able to be a full measure of both of those things. It wasn't part grace and part truth, grace sometimes, truth other times. No, he was fully grace and fully truth all the time. It's interesting because you look at the life of Jesus and there were times whenever it seemed like he was so forgiving, but then there were other times where it felt like he was holding everybody accountable. And there were times when, when Jesus would say something that seemed so harsh, but then he would follow it up with something that was so incredibly kind. Like it would, oftentimes that would happen in the exact same conversation. There were times whenever Jesus would, would be so quick to point out sin, but then there were other times, it's almost like he ignored it altogether. And there's this tension that you see in Jesus's life because like John says, he was full of grace and he was full of truth. And last week we learned about the woman that was caught in adultery and how the religious people gathered around and they wanted to stone her to death. And so Jesus looks at them and says, okay, well let him who's without sin cast the first stone. And so they look around, they realize they've got sin of their own and they all leave. And then Jesus stoops down, he looks at this woman and he says to her, he says, I don't condemn you. And then he follows that up by saying, now go and leave your life of sin. And it's like, wait, 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 like, which, which is it? Is it, I don't condemn you or is it, you're a sinner, you should stop that? Well, yes, it's both. Yes, I don't condemn you. And yes, you're a sinner, you, you need to stop that. Well, well, if she's not condemned, then did you have to bring up the whole sin part? Yes. And here's part of the reason why, gang, sometimes you need to realize that it's our brokenness that reveals our need for a savior. Now our temptation, because of the way that we're wired up is we want to resolve the tension. We just want it to be all grace or we want it to be all truth. But whenever you do that, you lose because you give up something incredibly important. Now Jesus was much better at managing this tension and being fully grace and fully truth than churches are. That's just the truth. See, often churches lean one way or the other. And some of you, maybe you grew up in a church like that and they were like all truth and everybody loved it. <laughs> but it felt like there was something missing or, or the church you grew up in was all grace and everybody loved it, but it still felt like something was missing. And gang, I think that feeling that something's missing thing, it points to this tension because Jesus was all truth and he was all grace. And so over the years, we've tried our best to be both, to be all truth and all grace. And honestly, we haven't always gotten it right. In fact, we might not be getting it, getting it right right now, like right while we're trying to walk through the series, but we're doing the best we know how to be all grace and to be all truth, like Jesus. And sometimes that is messy. And there have been times where, um, where we've left you wondering, like, what is it that they believe? Like, I wish they'd just come out and say it. And there have been other times where we left you thinking, man, I wish I didn't know. <laughs> like, do they have to say all of that? And whenever we get those emails or whenever we begin to sense some of that frustration, it just makes me smile because it makes me wonder if maybe we're getting some of this right. Or, or in moments whenever we get messages and people say like, man, that was really hard, but I'm so glad I was there. I'm so glad that I came. Or man, that brought up some things that I didn't, want, I didn't want to think about. But I'm so glad that you made us think about those things and process those things. Or man, that was really challenging. But I'm really glad I was there because now I've got something to be able to share with my kids on this topic. I didn't know what to say about. See, often, I think it's the challenging conversations. It's the hard conversations that push us and cause us to ultimately grow. So... With all of that as a backdrop, I want to talk about sex and sexuality. 
Now, there are some of you who've been hurt by your conversations about sex and sexuality um, in the context of church. And if that's you, I just want to say I'm so sorry. I mean, I think the church should be the safest place to have these kinds of conversations. And here's the reason why. is because in Jesus, we find both grace and truth. And the church should be a reflection of that. You should find both grace and truth. Also, I understand that for many of you, maybe you aren't a follower of Jesus. And so honoring God with how you approach sex is not like, you know, number one on your list of goals. It's not a priority for you. And I just want you to know that's okay. Like no judgment from me at all. I'm glad that you're here to be able to listen in. And if anything, you're going to have a fun story to share about how you got to, you know, listen in on this uh, really awkward day at church. Though I think that it'd be much more and much more meaningful than that. And so here we go. And last week we shared that we believe that the historical Christian view of sex best represents what a follower of Jesus is called to in the scriptures. And that is that by God's design, sex was meant to be between one man and one woman within the boundaries of marriage. You see, sex was God's idea. Like he came up with it and it was a good idea within the context, within the boundaries that God prescribes. Now, boundaries matter. Road boundaries matter, property boundaries matter, personal boundaries matter, they all matter. The question is, why do they matter? Often, the reason why they matter is because they're usually in place for our safety. I mean, think about that for a second. Like fire within the boundaries of a fireplace can be great, right? It can bring warmth, it can be beautiful, it can be purposeful. But you start throwing matches around outside the boundaries of the fireplace, and you'll burn your house down. See, boundaries aren't meant to be unnecessary restrictions for us. Rather, boundaries are meant to be in place to protect us and to protect other people, which brings up why God cares about this stuff so much. It's not just an arbitrary set of rules. No, God's desire isn't to restrict you. God's desire is to protect you. It's a, it's a father's love that causes him to create boundaries for his kids. And it's the same with our heavenly father. And so sex was meant to be between one man and one woman within the boundaries of marriage. And anything outside of that isn't part of God's design for us. And that actually includes a whole lot of things. It includes things like casual sex or hookup culture. It includes um, having an affair if you're a married person. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus um, included lust to that. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 28, here's what he said. He says, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And so pornography certainly would not be included in the boundaries of what God desires for us as it relates to sex. It's outside of God's design for us. And as we learned last week, our best understanding of the scriptures is that same-sex sex would fall outside of God's design for sex as well. Now, what's sad is that it seems like some churches and some people have elevated same-sex sex as something that's different, more egregious than any other sexual sin. And the truth is that it's not. Like, they're all in the same category, just not what God wants for us. Which means that whenever it comes to our own sexual brokenness, we're all in the same boat. Like, every single one of us. And some of you, maybe you're thinking, not you, you're a pastor. Like, you don't even do sex. <laughs> well, listen, I've got three kids, right? Like, they didn't just show up, right? Like, they got here somehow. I didn't buy them at a store. See, sex is and has been part of my life too, both in good ways and in broken ways. See, all of us have sinful inclinations and desires that call us outside of God's plan for our lives. The apostle Paul, he knew this. And so I want you to look what he said. He's pretty direct. He says this, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. He says, run from sexual sin, run. Now, this verse actually probably hits a little different for me than it does for, for you. And that's because whenever I read this, I'm thinking, man, there's not too many things on this planet that could actually make me run. You know what I'm talking about? Like, I'm not really the running type. In fact, if you see me running, 
you should start running immediately. Like, don't even think about it. Don't look back. Don't try and figure out why. You should just start running because I'm pretty sure something pretty dangerous, something pretty bad is going down. Just saying. And so whenever Paul says, run from this, I think it's because he knows the potential for harm that this can cause in our lives. Not just in our lives, but in the lives of other people too. I want you to look at this. First Thessalonians chapter 4, 3 through 6, it says this. God's will is for you to be holy, to stay away from all sexual sin. Then each of you will control his own body and live in holiness and honor, not in lustful passion like the pagans who do not know God and his ways. And that in this matter, no one would wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. No, running from or, or staying away from sexual sin, I mean, that like flies in the face of what's normal or what's expected in 2024. That's just true. And it can be easy to read a verse like this and just kind of dismiss it as irrelevant or archaic. It's like, man, that's just not up with the times. But I think it's really important to remind ourselves, to remember that, that God gives us boundaries, not to restrict us, but to protect us. God gives us boundaries for our good and for the good of others. In fact, did you catch the very last part of that verse? It says, it says, essentially, stay away from all sexual sin so that in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. Like there's this concern for other people as it relates to um, engaging in sex in a way that's outside of God's plan. And by doing that, you harm other people. I want you to think about this. Just humor me for a second. It's like, how is, how is that true? Like two consenting adults that are like, hey, you know, come on. Like, how is that harmful to anybody? Now, I want you to think about this. Let's, let's think about the flip. Think how differently our world would be. Like, just imagine with me how different our culture would be if everyone only had sex within the boundaries of marriage, like according to God's design. Like, think about this. The world would be more different then you realize, get this, there would be no sexual transmitted diseases, none, no STDs. AIDS wouldn't be a thing, it would go away. Teen pregnancy would be eliminated. And all the struggle of these young ladies, young men, having to, to figure out their teenage years and, and, and their young 20s while having and juggling a child, being a parent, that wouldn't exist. Unnecessary abortion, would end. There would be no sex slavery. None. Zero. There'd be no pornography. Get this. The emotional pain and shame that people have as a result of sexual regret would cease to exist. There'd be none of that. Marriages wouldn't be torn apart by infidelity. Families wouldn't be torn apart by adultery. King, that's what could happen in a society where people just reserved sex for marriage. Now you hear a list like that. You, you think of all those things just going away and you don't even have to believe in God to understand that that just makes sense, that this is a much better system. And gang, that's just some of the reason why. Now I wanna talk for the next few minutes about how. Like how do we make progress in that kind of a direction? Well, first I wanna talk about sex outside of marriage. And so let me talk to those of you that are single, uh, whether single or single again, let's talk to the singles. Uh, for some of you, not having sex would be a pretty significant change because whether you're in a committed relationship or not, sex has just always been part of how you do relationships. And so if, if you want that to be different, if you want that to change, if you wanna begin saying, God, I, I wanna do sex your way, then here's where I would start. I would start by praying and asking God to change your heart, to help you see sex the way that he sees sex and give you a desire to honor him in that area of your life. That's where I would start. You know, a couple verses after uh, that passage we just read in Thessalonians, it says that, that God actually gives us his Holy Spirit on the inside of us to help us do that, to help us begin to live those things out, that he doesn't leave us on our own to try and figure all this stuff out. But God says, I'll empower you by my spirit. I'll be with you. I'll send a helper to help you along the way and begin to transform your heart from the inside out. 
And so start by praying and asking for God to help change your heart and help you see sex the way he sees sex. And then number two, I would say this, set appropriate boundaries. Decide ahead of time that you're not going to cross them. Uh, so for example, what would be an appropriate boundary? Um, man, like I wouldn't date someone who doesn't have or intend to honor that same commitment. Like those same commitments, those same boundaries as it relates to sex. Don't, don't date that person. That'd be a good boundary um, to set an appropriate boundary to have. Hey, here's another one. For you, it might be related to alcohol. For some of you, you know what alcohol does to your ability to make good decisions. If you really want to honor this, if you really honor God as it relates to, to how you do sex, then, you know, some boundaries as it relates to alcohol would be a good place to start. Here's another thing. If you're dating, I think you just got to decide for yourself that you're going to honor that other person no matter what. You know what it means to honor somebody in that way? It means saying, you know what? I refuse to be a regret for you. And no matter, even if you don't think it's going to be a regret for you, I refuse to potentially be a regret for you. And so I'm not going to do anything that could take us down that road. And number four, I think you have to determine ahead of time what story you want to be able to tell. At some point, whenever you meet the person that you're going to marry, you're going to tell them a story. You'll have a story to tell. I mean, you should decide now what story you want to be able to tell and then begin living in such a way that one day you won't have to lie. You know what I'm talking about? Lots of people lie. And here's the reason why they lie is because they don't like the story that they wrote. Gang, don't do that. Just start over today. And then if you'll do that, then one day this will be your story. You'll say, hey, I, I, was, I was watching church one Sunday morning or during the week sometime. I was listening to some guy, God began to speak to my heart about this. And then from that moment forward, I started living my life in preparation for you. Hey, that could be your story. How baller would that be if that was your story? It's important. Now, let me talk to singles that are living together with, with somebody else. Listen, here's what I would say. If you're faithfully committed to each other, then just get married. Like what's keeping you from taking that step? Get married. If you're not faithfully committed to one another, then move out. In fact, what would happen if you just said something like, you know what? No more sex until we get married. I think you'd be amazed at how quickly that other person would hear from God. They'd be like, oh baby, uh, I really feel like you're the one for me. Or you know what? I, this, this just isn't working out. In which case, why should you be wasting your time? You should move on anyways, right? Now let's switch gears. I want to talk a little bit about pornography. That was brought up last week. And so let me talk real quickly about that. So pornography has become more accessible and more acceptable than ever before. In 2018, Gallup did a study and it said that 43% of Americans believe that pornography is morally acceptable. And so you might be wondering, like, what's the big deal? Like, what's so bad? Doesn't hurt anybody. Well, one, Jesus taught that if you look at a woman lustfully, that you've committed adultery with her in your heart. So that's, that's one. Two, beyond that, it's harmful because it literally trains your brain to objectify another human being. It begins shaping your worldview so that you begin to see others as objects to be used rather than being people to be loved. Here's another one. It's 100% an addiction. And you can't say that it is. If you've ever struggled there, you know it's 100% an addiction. It's harmful to you. And ultimately, that thing becomes your master. Jesus taught no man can serve two masters. Number four, the industry as a whole is harmful because there's a lot of human beings that are exploited and taken advantage of in order to create that content, in order to make those products. Number five, pornographic consumption is a gateway to, and it's a funder of more depraved sexual industries like sex trafficking. Like this feeds those other things. And so, man, that's why it's such a big deal. So you might be wondering, yeah, okay, you didn't have to convince me. What do I do? Well, number one, I think you got to tell somebody. Yeah, I've always heard it said, you're only as sick as your secrets. And so you got to tell someone. James chapter 5, verse 16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. 
The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Gang, I think there's, there's power in praying for one another, but there's also power in coming out of the darkness and pulling things into the light. Gang, that's where healing can happen. Number two, I'd say this, get help. Like if you could stop on your own, you would have already. And so get professional counseling. There's plenty of free options that are out there as well. And so don't let money keep you from getting the help that you need. Because the truth is you need to get and establish a plan so you can work your way forward from being held captive to that thing. And for those of you that are find yourself in a place where, um, where you struggle with pornography, you know how much of a struggle it is. Like you know how hard of an addiction it is to break. And so I'm saying you need to get a plan and you need to make sure that, um, that you get some help. It's really important. Now I want to talk, we'll switch gears again. Let's talk about same-sex attraction. And first of all, if you struggle with same-sex attraction, I want you to know a few things. And number one, you matter deeply to God. Like you matter deeply to God. Like he gave his life for you, just like he gave his life for anyone else. You need to know that. And if you've asked him to forgive your sin and, and to adopt you into his family, then you are a son and a daughter. And you and I, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And we're both on this journey together of learning what it means to surrender our lives to him, to follow him fully with all that we've got and allow him to be the king of our lives. And so you matter deeply to God. Number two, you matter to this church. Now I can't speak for every other church, but I can speak for this one. You matter to this church. Our driving desire, our, our North Star, if you will, is that every person in the city would follow Jesus because every person matters. We believe that. To our core, we believe that. And so you matter to us. Number three, you are welcome here. You need to know that. You are welcome here. I mean, even if you disagree with what we believe about God's design for sex, now our commitment as a church is to be like Jesus full of grace and truth. And Jesus loved being around people who, who didn't agree with him. And people who didn't agree with Jesus loved being around him too. Gang, I think that says something about the kind of church that we should be. I think that says something about the kind of followers of Jesus that we should be and how we should relate to other people that we don't necessarily agree with. We should be full of grace and we should be full of truth, never compromising. And so even if you uh, disagree with us, even if you never agree with our view on God's design for sex, you need to know that you are welcome here. And there are so many people who um, are same-sex attracted, and they think that the very last place that they could go to explore faith or to worship God would be church. And that's so sad. It's heartbreaking. That should not, that is not, and that will not be true here. Number four, we recognize that same-sex attraction is a uniquely challenging struggle. It just is. I mean, in so many different ways. Socially, it can be super challenging. I mean, can you imagine like always wondering if you're going to be accepted or rejected? Like every environment that you're in, every social setting, you're thinking, man, you know, is this a safe place or is this not a safe place? Like how difficult must that be? If you're a same-sex attracted person, who agrees with um, the historical Christian view of sex, then obedience for you to that historical Christian view is costly obedience. Like it's going to cost you something. Because there's only a few options, one of them being celibacy. The truth is that I know people who are same-sex attracted, but are committed as followers of Jesus to living out celibacy in submission to God in their lives. The culturally, I think part of the challenge for us is that we've elevated sex so much that we've made too much of it. And we think that no one can live or be happy without sex. Yes, you can. The person can live without sex. It's not air. You know what I'm saying? It's true. You can live without sex and you can still have a life that flourishes. Jesus showed us that. There are so many people that are single who never marry who demonstrate that, who show us that you can have a flourishing life even though sex isn't part of it. See, I think what people need more than sex is intimacy. And again, that can be found through connection with others. That can be found in relationship with other people. 
And so as followers of Jesus, if, if you have a family, then man, you should be the first one to be willing to open up your life to some single people that God brings into your life. You should be the first one to be willing to open up your home to some singles that God brings across your path so that they have a place to belong. And then number five, same-sex attraction as a follower of Jesus is a hard struggle. But I believe that God can use our struggles to make us whole in Him. See, it's a myth to believe that God never wants us to struggle. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul talks about having a struggle of his own. He refers, it, refers to it as the, a thorn in his flesh. And he says that he even prayed three times that God would take it away from him. Now, I want, I want to want to pick up in verse number 9 here in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 um, to see what he says next. He says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insult, in hardship, in persecutions, and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You know, we don't know what Paul's struggle was. It could have been a physical ailment of some sort. Some people believe it could have been same-sex attraction. All we know is that he prayed three times for God to take it away. And God said no. And God didn't say no because he didn't love Paul. God said no because he wanted something even better for him than that. And that was for God's strength to be made perfect in Paul's weakness. And it was in that struggle that Paul finds Jesus in such a deep, deep and profound way. And that, I believe, is what made the Apostle Paul the Apostle Paul goes on to write most of the New Testament, and he's used by God to advance the kingdom of God in a greater way than any other person on planet earth, except for Jesus himself. Not too shabby if you ask me. It reminds me of another guy, a more contemporary person. His name is Henry Nouwen. Uh, he's long past, but um, he certainly makes my short list of people in recent generations that God has used to be these profound spiritual guides for the rest of us. If you ever get a chance to read any of Henry Nowen's stuff, you should totally make sure you pick up one of his books and read it. But toward the end of his life, he actually shared how he lived his entire life. He was single, never got married. He lived his entire life as a same-sex attracted celibate Christian. And it was in that journey, it was in that struggle that he found Jesus in such a powerful way. And I believe that's what made Henry Nowen, Henry Nowen. That's what made him who he was. In fact, I recently watched a documentary about him and a bunch of people were talking about his influence on their lives. And so many of them said time and time again, they said, it was Henry Nowen who taught me just how deeply I was loved by God. And I'm so grateful for that. And as I heard person after person say that, I wondered if it was in his struggle that Henry Nowen was able to discover God's deep love for him. And so for those of you who are same-sex attracted, don't discount what God can do. Even through your struggle, lean into it and see how God works and moves. Because I'm telling you, this world needs more Henry Nouns. Now, I promised that I would, I would end this talk by telling you what happened with the disciples whenever Jesus um, was talking to them and, and they heard this hard teaching from him. And then he asks, he says, hey, um, do you want to leave too? Remember, I was going to tell you, kind of circle back around. I know that was a lot of sermon ago. <laughs> and so Peter, James, John, and Matthew, they are knee deep in this moment of decision. All of a sudden, there's this pregnant pause. And then out of nowhere, Peter, who usually says the wrong thing, says something that is so brilliant. John chapter 6, verse 68. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? And Jesus asked them, you don't want to leave too, do you? And Peter's thinking, well, yeah, I do want to leave. Like right now in this moment, this is hard. But to whom shall we go? You see, Peter recognized something that most people don't realize. And that is that whenever you choose to unfollow Jesus by default, you're choosing to follow someone or something else. And so Peter asks, if not you, then who? If not this, then what? To whom shall we go? Peter's like, like, who else is there? Me? 
I would make a terrible God. I tried that before. And so to whom shall we go? And then he goes on and he says this. He says, you have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. He says, you know, Jesus, this is hard right now. The truth is I've seen too much. I've experienced too much. Considering all that I do know, there's no one else who even compares to who you are. Like who else has offered eternal life to me? Who else has given themselves so that I can be forgiven? See, we have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. You see, in this moment, while others focused on what they didn't understand, what was hard to comprehend, what they couldn't get their arms around, Peter chose to stand on what he already had come to believe and to know. That is that Jesus is the Holy One of God. And that's what I want for all of us. Regardless of our struggles, regardless of the challenges we face, regardless of how we're broken sexually or, or not, I just want every single person to have a relationship with Jesus because it's in that relationship we find strength to move forward. And we come face to face with grace and truth. And that's what we need. Let me pray for you. God, we love you. We thank you so much that you first loved us. Lord, I pray you give us the wisdom to know what to do with what we just heard and the courage to do it. Lord, I pray that you would help us as a church to stand in what may be a messy middle to get stones from both sides in order to love the people that you place there. God, I pray you would help us as, as, as broken people sexually to look to you as our source of truth and begin to bend our will to yours, trusting that God, you're at work, that you will sustain, that you'll be with us through that as well. And Lord, as we walk through the rest of this series, I just pray that you would continue to lead the way Help us follow you fully. For those of you who uh, you hear me talk about having a relationship with Jesus and you're like, I didn't even know that was a thing. It is a thing. And I want that for you. And so if you're ready to step across the line of faith and ask Jesus to be the forgiver of your sin, to be the leader of your life, to be in a relationship, a personal relationship with him, like what I described, I just want to ask you to pray this prayer along with me. So Jesus, I ask you to be the forgiver of my sin ask you to adopt me into your family as a son, as a daughter, and help me to live for you with all my heart. Thank you for being my savior. Lord, you're also my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, everybody, hope you're challenged and encouraged. See you next week. Thanks so much, Ken. These are really tough topics to navigate. So thank you so much for being here and for leaning in as we all seek to know and follow Jesus more fully. And thank you so much to all the questions you guys have already sent in as a part of this series. Questions are a natural and really important part of growing in our faith. And we want this to be a place where questions are welcome. So if any questions were stirred up today, feel free to send them in through the hub. The information for texting in to access the hub is up on the screen right now. And for anyone who is in the Philly area, next Wednesday, August 28th, we'll be hosting our Tough Talks Q&A, where some of our pastors will be responding to the questions that you guys have sent in throughout the series so that we can continue the conversation. So that's gonna be held at Epic Roxboro at 7 p.m. on the 28th. Well, thanks so much for being here today. I hope to see all of you right back here next week. <laughs>